it in terms of, of life. And we're not really asking you to redo the lecture that you just did for us, but have you found that there are ways to engage clients initially in conversation about the salience of compassion to one's life so that it's uh, quickly or often palatable to clients so we can then move on to do the rest of the portions of the psychotherapy? Okay, let me give you an example, right? Supposing you're doing therapy with aggressive men. That's a tough one, right? So how would you introduce compassion with them, right? So one of the ways in which you can do this is firstly ask these guys, we're doing compassion work, you say that we're doing compassion work, and they all go, no. So what does compassion mean to you? How do you understand compassion, right? And they say, oh, it's about being kind, it's about being gentle, it's about being soft, it's blah, blah, blah. It's being girly. Um, so then you say to them, okay, so what don't you like about that definition? And they say, well, everything, really, because I don't want to be weak, you know. I, I'm a guy, i got to be strong. You know? This world's a tough world, you know what I mean? You can't afford any of this compassion shit, right? So that's the kind of thing you get from these guys, right? So then you say to them, well, we actually agree with you. If compassion was going to make you weak, we'd strongly advise you not to do it. Particularly for guys who are in jail, right? Because they need to be tough, right? So then we give them the definition. So what about this definition, right? Sensitivity to suffering in yourself and other people and a commitment to try to do something about it. Do you think that's worth, do you think that's worth aiming for, trying for? And then we might say to them, do you realize there are two types of courage? There's physical courage, which is the ability to risk yourself, to put up with pain, to get into a fight for what you believe. And I suspect you guys have got that in loads and loads of it. But there's also what we call emotional courage, which isn't what you're feeling in the body. It's not about physical pain. It's about emotional pain. It's about dealing with stuff that has hurt you in the past, maybe caused great sadness that you've had to cover up, heal over, put sticking plasters on, and you're frightened to go anywhere near it. Now, compassion is also going to be very important for emotional courage. So the question is, guys, do you want to stay, do you want to develop emotional courage or not? Because compassion will help you, it, compassion will help you develop emotional courage. That's partly what it's about. It's partly about the ability to engage in the things that hurt us. Now, if you feel that you, you don't want to develop courage, you want to stay in the no courage at all for your emotions, then that's okay, we can do that. And of course, the moment you put in things like that, people say, oh, no, no, I, I, would, I would like to be able to have courage to deal with my pain. So, you, you, you know, you can deal with your pain by being physically courageous and all that stuff, or cutting yourself, and you're doing all that stuff if you want to, it's not, you know, so it's up to you. But, you can also learn to heal all this stuff that goes on inside you, all the pains that you carry, but you're going to have to develop courage, and that's the thing. Are you prepared to travel with me so we help you develop your courage, right? Now, when you put it like that, you see, you're much more likely to have people buy it. Think about the fact of working with, because you've got a big veterans, uh, you've got a big veterans group in, uh, in San Francisco. So let me give you another example here. Veterans, of course, can come back because they've seen terrible things and done terrible things. <clears throat> And, of course, one of the point problems for veterans is that they can, it can be very personal. And so one of the things is helping them realize that actually the human brain is very, very uh, tricky and to remember all of the terrible things that humans have done to other humans. You know, just 2,000 years ago, a couple of thousand miles from you in a place called Rome, they used to butcher people for entertainment, and that went on for 700 years. Humans do very, very bad things, so make no mistake about that. But we don't choose it, right? It's in us, but that we didn't put it there. And helping this process of depersonalization is extremely important for de-shaming people. So p part of the answer to your question is, the way you explain compassion very much depends on the kind of person you have sitting in front of you and the kind of problem they have. So we'd say, 
a woman who's been sexually abused as a child, you wouldn't necessarily approach compassion in that way. You would talk about it in a very different way for them. So how you help them to recognize this process of developing the skills to engage the suffering, right, and the wisdom to be able to heal that suffering. How you do that, that depends upon the person. You're right if you took one last question before we sure. say goodbye. Does anybody want to ask another question before we part and we can continue our discussion later? Sure. Um, I'm interested in a little Maybe bit if you bring up your voice, maybe I don't even have to, yeah. tar- to translate to the computer. Um, I'm interested in this idea of de-shaming and um, the idea that maybe violent terrible things are present in humans, particularly thinking about clients who have been in prison and have themselves um, perpetrated violent acts and sort of thinking about how to apply the compassion to overcoming shame about things like that. Were you able to hear that, Paul? No, sorry. Okay, so the question is that there's an interest in de-shaming. And yeah. in particular with populations that might have been perpetrators themselves, for instance, people that were in the prison system and have done some bad things themselves and are not trying to heal and move on with their path of recovery, but they carry this deep burden of shame for things that they might have done. And I would say probably things have been done to them as well along the years. And how do you work in, in a de-shaming capacity with people that have gone through these routes? Okay, well, these are very advanced questions, right? Because we, I don't, I mean, I, I'm, I'm assuming that you're, you're still training. You wouldn't be diving off into prisons and working with very complicated people. I, actually, actually, out here we, we certainly do. So people go into practicums in prisons and, and, and military settings. It's very exciting in California. Okay. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's tricky to, to jump in with no experience, it's difficult. But um, the key point for you, right, is to remember your role. Your role as a therapist. Right? If you are an army doctor and somebody brings in uh, the enemy who's had a leg blown off, what do you do? Do you save them? Or do you say, no, I don't save you, you you've been killing our, our people, so I'm not going to save you. Our responsibility as therapists, right, is to be non-judgmental. That's our responsibility. That's what we've signed up for, that's what we're paid for. The legal system is judgmental. That's what they're paid for, and that's what they do. The prison system puts people in jail. That's what they do, right? That's not what we do. What we do, and what we're paid for, is to be, for that person, as non-judgmental and as empathic as we can to try to heal them of the pain that's caused them to do what they've done. So compassion isn't saying to somebody, oh, look, you've just done these horrible things, it's okay, here's a ticket, go to the Bahamas, have a holiday. No, 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 it's not that. It's, can I understand in you what has caused you to do this harm to another person? Can I understand in you what is at the root of this whatever it is that's causing you to be, to have gone cold, to have lost your heart, to be insensitive to the pain that you feel. Now occasionally you may discover, or you may think, it's genetic, that there are some individuals who, for biological reasons, just lack empathy, and I'm afraid they do, and I, I don't think anybody's got the answer to that. But as the therapist, my job is to understand what is the pain in them that's caused them to do that, and can I help them to do that? And along the way, it's not for me to blame or shame. In fact, I want to try and stop that, because if they get too much into that, they won't explore in their pain. What I am interested in, very interested in, is moving out of shame and helping them begin to experience guilt. Now, Yasin will talk to you a lot about the difference between shame and guilt in our model. The ability to experience guilt means that you can begin to recognize and process the pain that you have caused so that you can begin to feel sorrow and remorse. Because what we know is that shame is not a very good way to change behavior. Because if people can avoid it, they do. Shame is about focusing in on yourself. So supposing, for example, I have... Supposing two men have had an affair, (laughs) and their wives discover it. Tom and Harry, call them Tom and Harry. And Tom says, oh my goodness, my wife has discovered this affair, now she's not going to like me very much, 
And you know what? It's true. I'm a bad person. It's all my fault. I'm terrible. Uh, she's going to tell her friends they won't like me either. Everybody will think I'm so bad and they'll punish me and they won't want to be my friends anymore. I'll buy her some flowers. <laughs> See, the problem with shame is it's me, 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 oh, and me, right? Whereas guilt is the focus of the attention is not on the self and how bad you are. The focus of the attention is on the other person. It's on the harm that you've done to them. It's having an empathic connection. It's resonating with their suffering. Remember, compassion is about sensitivity to suffering. Shame, you're not sensitive to suffering. You have no sensitivity to the suffering you've caused at all. Because you're too focused in on yourself. How bad I am, I'm so bad, I'm so bad, I might as well just kill myself now. I'm so bad, I'm so bad. That isn't going to do anything for anybody, right? What you need when you're working with these folks is that you develop this capacity for thinking, Oh my God, what have I done? What have I done? And when you get that, now you're beginning to move, right? And Yogan is absolutely right. Many of these people will not be able to process what they've done to others until they have worked through what was done to them. So the point about it is, is it's not for us as therapists to, to share. The, 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 the law system will do that. That's their job, and I'm very happy for them to get on and do that. I don't want pedophiles or, you know, Serial killers walking the streets. Thank you very much. But my job is then, when the, they're in the prison or wherever they are, to, to try to heal what's causing them to do those bad things. That's what I'm there to do. So, and that's where we begin to realize that you know, any, any one of us, any one of us who had been kidnapped as a three day old baby and brought up in their environment, we might be the same. That is the beginning of an empathic journey. Okay? We like to think we wouldn't be. We'd like to think that if I had been kidnapped as a three-day-old baby and put into their environment and brought up by their parents and abused in the way that they were abused, I would have turned out like an angel. But unfortunately, that isn't the evidence. The evidence is probably we would have done the same. So, a mixture of genes and environment um, causes the problem. So, we, as a society, we need to have rules and regulations. I mean, the fact of the matter is, if anybody tried to put on a Roman Games now, if anybody went downtown in San Francisco and said, come on, folks, we've got all these people, we're going to watch them kill each other, you'd all go to prison for love, right? But 2,000 years ago, that was regarded as a great thing. So societies change, values change, the things we see as, as criminal now are criminal because I absolutely think we need to become a little bit more compassionate. We don't want that sort of stuff. Just like we 